Good, we see people dialing in. We start and uh, welcome to the Kion webinar again. It's a series of webinar. This is now the fifth Kion webinar we do. And today we focus on total hip replacement. So first of all, thank you very much for your time and your interest. My name is Guy. I'm since beginning of 2019, the CEO of Kion. Um, I would really like to say a great company with an amazing team behind. Our purpose, which we live every day, is to improve the quality of life for companion animals by equipping you with leading edge skills and tools. So leading edge tools refers to our commitment to make highest quality products and leading edge skills to our strong focus on education so that you can achieve best outcome in your daily activities. Even during these challenging times we face today, um, in the last couple of months, we do our best to provide you the best learning experience. So now to THR. When um, Slobodan Tepic founded Kion in 1999, his first focus and product was the total hip replacement system, which he introduced to the market in 2002. Over the last 20 years, more than 20,000 dogs and cats and including a tiger, by the way, by Aldo, have been treated with the, the Zurich Cementless hip replacement system. Until today, the system has gone through multiple iterations, aiming to improve the long-term performance of the device. And we are now at the sixth generation of Zurich Cementless total hip replacement system. So Kion has a long history and successful, a successful history with total hip replacement and I'm excited to hear more about it from our speakers today and um, who have really contributed heavily to the today's total hip replacement system. So I'm grateful to announce all Dr. Aldo Vizzoni from Cremona in Italy, um, then Steve Brezina, our chief technology officer who started working 33 years ago with Slobodan Tepic and also on board we have Dr. Otto Lenz, professor at Virginia Tech in the US, who acts as well as chief medical officer at Kion. Otto will manage and moderate your questions after the talk. The next slide, you can see quickly a very short introduction how you have to handle like questions. Um, you can ask questions throughout the webinar. Feel free to do that. Um, there's a, a tab called questions as shown on the screen one for desktop and one for mobile and um, please raise them there and uh, we will finalize uh, at, the, at the end of the webinars we will go into that so let's get it started i wish you a great learning experience and i'm handing over to you steve for the first talk great thank you Guy. pleasure to be here let's see how the sharing works yeah it does it does great okay so as Guy said, this is the sixth generation of the Zurich Cementless THR. And this is the, this is the timeline of those changes. And it doesn't mean that, you know, that we found that there was a bug with the system and then we made a change to it. it this, when we started this, you know, ultra high molecular polyethylene was state of the art. Everything that we had at the time was state of the art, but as the art changed, we've adopted and changed the system. So you can see now, you know, the last few changes, we've added what's called a double shell on the cup. We have changed the polyethylene to peak and carbon fiber peak rings. We have HA coatings. We now have ceramic heads. So it's really the best that you can find in orthopedics that are being used in the Kion THR. Again, there is lots of cases that were done. As Guy said, there's over 20,000 total cases now by more than 280 surgeons. We are now at about between 1,200 and 1,400 procedures per year. Um, and we now, with the generation six, really will probably find difficulty in, in determining what we're going to be able to do for generation seven. So, this is what generation six looks like. The stems have this white coating on them. We have these series of necks with different offsets. The screws are special screws that lock the stem to the medial cortex and the heads are pink. That's the, the trademark of the Ceramtex Biolux, which for veterinary use is called Verilux material. And then the cups have the kind of light brown peak with the black ring, carbon fiber peak ring on the inside. 
So there are three problems that we are defined that we need to solve for THR. And these have been from the beginning and still the same. So the stem needs to be attached to the bone and it has to be strong enough. Same with the cup, attachment of the cup to the bone and strong enough. And then the largest problem that's been addressed by the industry over the last 10, 15 years is how to reduce production of wear materials between the head and the cup lining material. So problem one, how do we solve that? Well, we look at the stem bone attachment. You know, you have, you have to fix the stem to the bone and you have to do it so that it's immediate and indefinite. And this is, you know, okay, that can be done immediate fixation you can get with cement, but that's not gonna be very indefinite because as we know in, in very active animals that cement mantle breaks down fairly quickly and you know, a year, two years later, how well those things are held in place is questionable. It fits the majority of canal shapes and sizes, you know, with a limited number of implants. I mean, we go from now with our mini THR system, we can go from about a two kilo size toy breed dog up to tiger size, 200 kilo tiger is the range of products that we can cover with, you know, about 10 different sizes of implants which is pretty spectacular when you think that on some human press fit systems, there are 80 stems. So you have 20 stems to cover all the sizes. You have them with the collar and without a collar, that makes 40, and you have them in left and right. So that makes 80 different components to cover just for, for humans. So with 10 sizes, I think it's quite amazing that you can cover all of the, the breeds and sizes of animals that we can cover with, with the the locking screw fixation, which is the technology how we get immediate and indefinite fixation. Now, it can also be used in young patients since the fixation is really only to the medial cortex. As the femur were to con continue to grow, the stem will just move along with it. It's not like a, a press fit system where as the femur grows, you would start to lose your press fit. And Another thing that's very important to reduce stress shielding is that there's no coupling of the medial and lateral cortices, and you'll see how, how we achieve that with a, with a gap on the lateral side. So the inspiration for the locking screw fixation of the stem for THR usage comes from the work that Dr. Tepic was doing back in the AO in the late 80s for locking screw fixed plates with the PC Fix project. So if you look at how this plate looks with the screws fixed to it, and then you move that plate to the inside of the femur, well, basically you have this. You have a plate with locking screws in it with a peg on top and a, that allows you to put a neck on there that transitions it to a cup. So this is how it looks if you just wanna look at a rough sketch here. You have joint forces would come to the head on the stem, those get transferred to the bone by shear transferred across the screws. And then you have muscle forces on the greater trochanter. And because this is being fixed by screws that are serving as pegs now locked to the stem on the medial side, you don't need contact on the lateral side. You don't need to press the stem in there the, into some sort of a, a conical shaped form that's gonna allow the stem to not subside when it finally goes down far enough. These, these stems are immediately stable. They're gonna stay in that position where the screws are locking it to unless something doesn't go right, which seldom happens. The, the stem fixation is the easiest part of the key on THR. And it's important that it stays stable immediately because you want to get bone on growth onto the stem as soon as possible because bone on growth is what allows the load sharing to happen more the, the transition is more gradual over the whole length of the stem and not just right at the top proximal portion. So the gap is important because if you put a stiff tube into a soft or a stiff component into a soft shell, a soft tube, you'll end up having a, a much different load configuration on that outer tube, which is our femur. And by locking this only to the medial cortex, you decouple the medial and lateral cortices from the, the stem. So the stem is only sitting on the medial cortex 
and the lateral cortex then still sees the same loadings as it would under normal anatomical conditions. So by this construct, there's very little stress shielding compared to, like if you look in human uh, THR systems that are press fit, there's a lot of bone loss in the proximal part. And we don't see that at all with the Keon THR system. So as well, over the time, we have done things to improve the strength of the stems because notoriously as smaller or younger and younger patients get operated, the canal size at the time of the surgery is much smaller than what you would, than you could fit a appropriate size stem in for when the dog becomes an adult. So in the generation four stems, we we change to a shot peening procedure that then uh, gives a good strain hardening to the outer surface. As well, we made it two tenths of a millimeter wider. Uh, these changes gave us about a pri approximately a 5% increase in the strength. Then in the generation five stems, we changed the production to forging first and then shot peening afterwards and then they're coated. And this gave us again an additional 5% increase in strength. You would say, well, 10% increase in strength doesn't seem like very much. Well, it's probably not very much if you want to look on the vertical axis of this chart and you're looking at just the increase in the load that it could stand under static tests. We're more interested in the horizontal axis of this chart. So if you look at the, at the point there, the case where you've got, you know, we've got 10 million cycles over seven years, we don't see hardly any failures that would be considered according to this loading. But they start to fail sometimes as if you have say 50 cycles a year, 100 cycles a year of a loading that's much higher. So these are loadings like this. So if you had that 10% increase in the strength, well, you know, if we had 350 cycles of this over seven years, and now we increase the strength by 10%, look at how much we gain on the horizontal axis. On the horizontal axis, we gain almost 10 times the number of cycles. So here we only could take 350 cycles at that load, but now by getting 10% higher strength, we are out to 3000 cycles. So almost a factor of 10 greater number of cycles at that load increment. So that, that's very important that we can gain that much strength with just these few things that give us 10% increase in strength. Another thing that is essential is that the bone on growth comes early. So this failure here, what has happened is that some years post-operative, the amount of polyethylene particles, and Dr. Vizzoni will talk about this, is the burden of these polyethylene particles causes bone to, well, to atrophy, and you start to lose the contact of the bone to the proximal part of the stem. So since the load sharing is not from the bone to the stem anymore, the distal end of the stem is the only part that's held, and the, this transition at the third screw hole, which is seen all of the twisting loading is where there's failure of the stem. So very important to keep the on growth onto the stem over the long period of time. And so to get that bone on growth on there quickly, we have gone to uh, using a coating. And that coating is a HA coating. So HA coatings, you know, have been shown in the human orthopedics that they, they really promote early on growth and and just by putting that on there, the, the bone really likes to adhere to that surface. And we see that that is really helping that there's not, you know, very rarely do we see cases where there's loss of bone on the proximal part of the stem, unless there is this very high uh, number of polyethylene particles. So the final stem that we now call the sixth generation of stem, you know, it's the best alloy you can get. It's titanium aluminum niobium, which is the most biocompatible of the alloys. The manufacturing process with forging is, is typical for human orthopedics. Surface preparations are done to, to strain hard in the surface to give it still extra strength. And then it has a, a pure titanium HA coating onto the surfaces that should be contacted by bone. So second problem is the cup bone attachment. Well, we have an open shell structure and in order to create this open shell structure, we've had to make our shells out of two components because the outer shell, we want to be very compliant to the bone. So not stiff. If you had a 
if you had a very thick shell with some holes in it, it would be much stiffer than the, the construct that we have. And it's HA coded for quick integration. So one of the most common failures in THR is loosening of the cup. Potentially that comes from an insufficient press fit at the, at the operation time. But we want that bone can grow onto it and into it quickly. So the, the cups that we make are made of these double shells. So you can see here, this, this outer shell has all of these holes. So these are the holes in the outer shell. And the amount of metal is very, very little. And that keeps it compliant so that the stiffness of this titanium by the geometry with the holes helps to soften it so that it is more closely to the, the stiffness of the cancellous bone that it's made it against. In between it is a gap. Then there's a solid shell, which is the back support to the liner, which used to be polyethylene and now is, is P. And you can see that when you have such an open structure like this, that the bone does grow nicely into those holes and you get really good integration of these cups into the cancellous bone. And when you look at these five years down the line in x-rays, you hardly can tell that anything has even happened at that surface between the bone and the cup as if it was just pressed in there the day before. So these are the cups, you know, they're double shell construction. They're this titanium alloy, turning, milling, holes are cut appropriately, they're HA coated again. And now with the new liners, which I'll talk about now with the peak carbon fiber peak liner, we can address the wear part of the joint. So that was problem three. Problem three is the aspherical bearing. So aspherical bearing is the way that we've addressed the wear by making a geometrical change to the coupling between the head and the liner. Now, our bearing material is ceramic on carbon fiber reinforced peak, which has been shown to provide one of the lowest wear couplings that's available. So we've made some changes here. Our generation four cups were ultra high molecular polyethylene with the FOSA geometry, that's this aspherical bearing. Then generation five cups, we went to carbon fiber reinforced peak ring. And then with generation six, we changed the heads to uh, the very luxe manufactured by Ceramtech. So we've worked together with a company called Sign Orthopedics, which is Dr. Slobodan on Tepic and myself, where we are trying to bring the Zurich cementless THR technology to the human orthopedic market. And you can see the, the human one here, it's just a little bit different. The screws are put in from the medial side instead of lateral, but very similar technologies. And with Scion, we had to develop a way to come up with wear reducing on the on the coupling between the head and the liner but as a small company in the human orthopedics we could not get involved with metal on metal we didn't want ceramic on ceramic and cross-linking polyethylene was not clear what the long-term results were going to be for that so our solution was a geometric change so this is what happens when you have a hard surface um, round pressing on a flat surface or one with a different radius, you get a high concentration of stress there. So these Hertzian contact stresses is what we wanted to try to avoid. And we did that by creating basically a dimple in the liner. So we've made in the liner where the contact is, we've made a recess there. And there's a special shape to the recess. Or you can flatten the head. And if you flatten the head, both of these things are changing the loading from being at the point here at the pole to basically a ring that is at 45 degrees around the circumference of the head. And by doing that, you see here, you put load there, you've got fluid in here. As you press the head into the liner, this pressure, this amount of fluid is under pressure. It tries to escape, but it can't escape because it's being sealed at the ring of contact which allows there to be a sustained fluid flow out, which means that the, the fossa, we call it, maintains the lubrication. So this should have some benefits. And we've done a whole series of testing with, on the hip simulators with these. And there is a, a, a good reduction be, compared to the standard geometry. Standard geometry of the same materials, uh, the fossa, so the geometric change gives you a three times reduction in wear. 
So recently we thought, well, how can we get away from polyethylene and use another technology we had, which was a ring with a contact point. And here what we've done is we can see, we've put a ring here of carbon fiber reinforced peak inside of a peak liner because data shows that carbon fiber reinforced peak when mated with the ceramic head gives us the lowest amount of, of wear. So if we started out here with what was kind of standard with a cobalt chrome head on standard poly, and then by changing to the fossa, so the, the aspherical bearing, we're down to this level of about three and a half milligrams per million cycles. And then by making the change to ceramic and to carbon fiber reinforced peak, we expect to be down here in pretty much an immeasurable amount of wear. So that we think this is gonna make, have a significant effect on the long-term results where typical failures up till now would be either the polyethylene liner wearing out or the amount of polyethylene debris causing the, causing the stems to loosen. And how is CFR peak? Well, there's enough studies that show that yes, it is a good material to use in, in the body. Um, it's used in bearings and the biologic response of CFR peak is very similar to that of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And since there's such a large amount of fewer particles, we expect that to be even more significant that there's much less response to the particles from CFRP. So these are the heads that we use. These are made by Ceramtech. It's a company in Germany. They make approximately, well, they've had over 8 million implanted components of so this is a zirconia toughened alumina. Their trademark for human use is Biolux Delta. And for veterinary use for Keon, it is called Verilux. And Keon has a exclusive license for this material in the veter veterinary industry. So we have these different combinations now. We have heads that are 16 and 19 millimeter diameter. The 16 is used with a 21 and 23 size cup and the 19 with a 26, 29 and 32 size cup. So with our peak CFR peak liners, we think we've really made the right step in moving away from ultra, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, the peak carbon fiber reinforced peak materials are very compatible. We see the response to debris particles of this similar in the body to ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And it's the lowest wear combination possible with the ceramic heads. So in all of these steps that we've taken, we think that now with our sixth generation, uh, THR that we have, we have probably um, the best system out there and human patients would be happy to get such a high quality combination of materials. And with that, um, well, questions that you may have can be brought up in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. For the first presentation, and as Steve said, this, um, please raise the questions in the tab, like called questions, so you can raise that, type that in. We will follow up um, with them with Otto later on. We are now handing over to Aldo, Dr. Aldo Vizzoni, for the second presentation. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I don't know if this morning or evening uh, here in Europe is evening in the United States this morning. So, hello everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and to, and to tell you what is uh, my experience with this uh, new uh, system of uh, Kion uh, total rib replacement. And so I will also tell you what are my thoughts uh, about uh, this procedure after 3000 cases I have done. Well, uh, why so many, um, what is uh, the, the, the main feature in, um, in this uh, new system? So this is really a new system. It's um, very little to be connected with the previous one because the most critical points were already addressed and solved. And uh, the main uh, aim was to provide a lifelong uh, lasting hip replacement for dogs of any size and cats too. So the um, concern of the owner when they do, when they accept to have their dog uh, treated with a total replacement in a young age, uh, 
uh, their concern is uh, how long will last those prostheses because they know that in people after 15 maximum 20 years in, in young people they need to replace uh, the cap or something else so um, that was uh, the main uh, point to be addressed then also the surgical technique has been uh, tuned uh, in the years uh, to reduce complication and we have been able to reduce complication under three percent as i will show you and another interesting point is the versatility of this system so we can treat every condition requiring a replacement and also in case of a, uh, complication we can have successful revisions keeping the prosthesis working another interesting point is about what's new today is the increased awareness of the indication and benefit of a total liberation in dogs among people among dog, dog owners and this is the testimony of uh, many pet owners uh, about the improved uh, well-being of their dog after thr so my dog is now smiling from lazy to hyperactive from sad to euphoric uh, from age to younger and he is an happy dog now so those are the best witness of the thr efficacy and that is the reason why so many cases I had to deal with because uh, my clients were passionate and effective counselor for other clients because they were bringing their own experience, their own witness on the efficacy of the procedure. And so you can see a dog that is working. Yes, it's working, but it looks like an old dog. It's just a six years old. And the owner was quite um, uh, worried about uh, the weakness of the of that dog uh, not willing to go out uh, getting tired and uh, look one year later that is a completely different dog because now it's an happy dog because uh, his zips are no more painful so he feel uh, comfortable you want to jump you want to run and never tired so the sixth generation of um, zurich total replacement has um, brought five revolutions those are the main points I focus nowadays. So we have a permanent and quick host integration uh, thanks to the HA coating. We have a peak cap liner to replace the polythene liner and we saw the advantage of that. The ceramic head to reduce friction inside the joint and then the dual mobility cap to reduce a dislocation, particularly in big dogs and the segment lens mini THR for small dogs and cats. Those are the five revolution, and I will go through uh, each of those points. About also integration, uh, that is uh, very important to have a, a primary fixation through the screws, and the screws are locking screws, so the stem is very strongly fixed inside the bone, and that will allow the dog to work immediately on a leash for security, but we don't need any cage confinement. That is one of the problem for the owner they don't want to have their dog in a cage and so we can avoid the cage confinement it's just enough to keep the dog on a leash when he's outside and is leave is live free in the house about the secondary fixation by also integration which is the permanent uh, uh, stability inside the bone the advantage of the first revolution was to add uh, the hydrocephatite coating that really uh, speed up so much the integration, uh, particularly if you put some blood clot before inserting the stem inside the bone. And then you can see here, it is a Bernese mountain dog, three years follow up, a beautiful bone contact all over without any stress shielding. Another advantage was I introduced last year for big dogs, uh, uh, 50 to 60 kilogram dogs to have a, a X large giant stem with a reinforced uh, shoulders here and so much stronger for those big dogs. But the cup liner uh, to, with a peak to replace a polyethylene liner, that was the most important point to me because, you know, our dogs, our dogs have been treated with bilateral hip displays, but look how much they move. So they have a much more activity compared to people, for instance. So that is the reason why with polyethylene, we saw particularly in young dogs, uh, quite a very early wear of the polyethylene. Also big dogs like this German Shepherd, for instance, uh, 
So uh, the stress on the input is very strong because he likes to jump, to run and to stop and to run and to jump, playing with other dogs, uh, making so much effort on the on the you know, on the hips. Many owners like to go on vacation and they like to see the dog running and again a lot of stress on the implants. Even small dogs they are run like crazy because dogs like they like to run. Uh, that is in their attitude to run, and because of pain-free joints that they run so much that they can cause wear in the in the in the cup if uh, not protected with a better material compared to polyethylene. Also, we have dogs that do agility, and of course they do training many times, and uh, they do training every day, and then many times in the year they do racing also. So that means a lot of stress on the implants. Even small dogs uh, like this, the Cocker Spaniel with bilateral hip replacement, he likes to run. Of course, the loading is less because of the body weight, but also the implants are smaller. So the uh, activity, the wear can be quite uh, dangerous for those uh, small dogs too, if not uh, with a uh, good implant. So polyethylene was really a disaster. And uh, that was particularly a big problem in young dogs. That being addressed, that technical problem has been addressed by implant improvement. So we move from uh, the original uh, Heads uh, with a nitrate uh, titanium to uh, the amorphous diamond like coating that was more smooth, uh, and also the fossa. But nevertheless, uh, there was a, a wear production, and the, re the reaction was uh, dependent by the biology of uh, biology of each patient. So in some dogs, uh, we saw a huge uh, um, granuloma formation inside the, the capsule and the joint space. And uh, also that wear was quite soon. This uh, was an uh, Irish setter five years after total replacement. So the head was uh, destroyed completely, the polyethylene going into contact with the metal and creating a lot of debris. And that debris caused also bone resorption along the stem. And that was one of the most common causes of uh, failure and breakage of the stem because of bone resorption in the proximal part and then uh, twisting a micro motion of the proximal part of the stem and the breakage because the distal part was still well integrated and you see a, again a huge uh, body reaction to that um, debris. But sometimes like in this uh, Labrador uh, you see that two months late after surgery and the, there is a good bone contact of the stem but even just 2.5 years later you can see that we have a bone resorption along the proximal part of the stem. And the, moreover, we see much more at the 3.5 years. So at 3.5 years, if you look at the, at, the, uh, um, at the relationship between the, fem the um, prosthesis head and the cap, here is a, a co um, coaxial. While if you go and see uh, in the other view, sorry, uh, I went to fast. If you see here, uh, the head uh, went completely inside the cup and again you see a, a lot of bone resorption along the, the stem. This is a big stem so it did not break but anyway there is uh, some reaction here and could break later on. So the second revolution was really uh, the peak cup uh, and the carbon fiber reinforced peak inside the, the most the, where the loading is more concentrated. And uh, again, uh, to, uh, uh, to have a better and uh, precise uh, uh, press fit for those caps, uh, especially uh, uh, reamers, uh, uh, to calibrate uh, the preparation of the satabul has been prepared also with a trial uh, caps so you can set and test uh, if the press fit was good. This one is one of the oldest dog I did uh, as, as far concerning the follow up. So it's a four year follow up, and there is no bone resorption all around the stem and all around the cup, and the, and the head is well centered inside. So that was really the, uh, the third revolution, and uh, Steve already presented um, the advantage of um, the um, wear in combining the peak with the ceramic head. The ceramic head came in, uh, in production 
since October 2017. So the combination of ceramic head and peak was a really a, a great advantage uh, to really create a, a big revolution in cementless hip replacement. Yeah, uh, I did already more than 700 cases implanted with um, uh, ceramic head and peak, and uh, the longest follow-up is two years, so no problem for uh, so far. And this is a German Shepherd three years later after a hip replacement, and you see a very beautiful bone contact, no signs of bone resorption around, around uh, along the, the implants. Another problem was uh, the, um, to reduce uh, the dislocation uh, risk in large breed dogs, particularly young dogs with luxoid hips like this Bernice, seven months old, and you see that uh, two weeks after the second hip it uh, dislocated. And so that was the fourth revolution. The fourth revolution was to have uh, this uh, special dual mobility cup, uh, which is quite common to use in human, in human people, in people because uh, uh, they can see the same problem. And so here we have a double, a double articulation. And uh, we have a cup uh, with a, a nitrate inside them, a titanium nitrate. And the head, uh, that is the real dual mobility, is the head, uh, because uh, the head has a, a surface in peak that is articulated inside the cup. And inside the peak head, we have a, a ceramic head that ceramic head cannot come out because it's a pre-assembled pre inside, it's a retentive. So to dislocate uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, big head, we need uh, to jump out uh, all the big head. So the small head, the ceramic head, will uh, pull out uh, the big head, but you see that uh, the jumping distance is so high, it's 25 millimeter the diameter. So is a uh, very difficult uh, to have such a dislocation. So really, we just presented the publication together with Autolands in, in over 100 cases, and we had only one dislocation, which occurred because of a deformity, deformation of the peak uh, uh, after a trauma. So here is the first case we did. Uh, it was a Leon Berger that uh, 15 days later luxated. So uh, we had to replace uh, the neck with a, an extra long neck, which is not good because of the stress on the implant. But uh, and the second hip, uh, we moved uh, with the first case of a dual mobility. You see here in surgery, which is inserted. And uh, that dog uh, uh, was treated in that way. And we have a longer follow-up. This is two months of follow-up. The dog was uh, working perfectly no tendency to dislocation, and this is 1.5 years follow-up, everything is stable. Uh, taking advantage of that, of the peak, so uh, liner, we don't need a bigger uh, thickness. In that way, even for smaller dog, uh, accepting the 26 cup, uh, we can have a, a bigger head than the 19 millimeter head that is much more resistant to luxation or dislocation and the uh, range of motion is increased from 120 to 150 degrees. And this is an example in a flat coated with a um, quite lax uh, joint that being treated with a, this a new cup. And uh, again, the, the last uh, revolution is uh, the all the series, the mini series, seven less for small dogs and cats. So ranging from dogs so from one to 15 kilograms, because after 15 kilograms, most of the time, the regular uh, implants are, are suitable. And we have uh, stem sizes ranging from three millimeter to six millimeter, with a four and five in between. And the cap size is from 10 millimeter to 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. And the head size, six, six millimeter, head millimeter, 10 and 12. And we can use, uh, we can combine in 10 changeable. So we can use, for instance, uh, a, small, um, a stem five with a, a bigger uh, cup, and then we can use a 16 millimeter head. So it's quite flexible. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, it's very useful. So you can move from one uh, different, uh, cup to a different stem and vice versa. Here is the example of the smaller 
uh, three millimeter stem, which is a very small, very thin, and uh, that is suitable for um, dogs, uh, two, three kilogram dogs. So we did a preliminary uh, study in 13 cases uh, uh, for dogs uh, ranging from two kilogram to 15 kilogram. And you see Jack Russell, Toy Pudo, Cats, uh, two Maine Coon, one British Maltese, Cocker, Border Collie, and Mongrel. And the most common um, uh, system we used was a four millimeter stem and about the cap, the 12 millimeter cap and uh, the eight millimeter, the eight millimeter head, but also we use a different size of heads. Here is the smaller dogs, uh, um, Rambo, a toy poodle, uh, five years old, uh, two kilogram with uh, uh, consequences of uh, necrosis of the femoral head, and uh, that is positioned in the table, so we look for fluoroscopy because it's quite critical to have a proper position of, of so small dogs uh, on the table to rely on the anatomical landmark for the cup orientation. Also the stem uh, preparation, very small, with a pressure reamer inside and the high-speed burr. And then uh, calibration of the small uh, uh, preparation of the small acetabulum. And here you see the small cup that we are inserting. Of course, we use a very gentle hammering because it's uh, very important to counteract the forces on the other side because they are so small, but then you can achieve a very good press fit. And then you can check with fluoroscopy the orientation of the cup. So small cups are completely producing peak, so there is only a ring of metal and uh, uh, all the rest is a peak. The stem is fixed with a special uh, jig, like the big jigs, but everything is smaller. So um, very tiny, very delicate procedure. And finally, you can reduce uh, the ceramic head inside, test uh, your stability, and then you can take your X-rays uh, to evaluate uh, the orientation of the, of the cups. And this is a uh, two months follow-up. Uh, that is uh, again in the good uh, Okay. About the cat, uh, this was uh, a Oreste, a British cat uh, with a slipped physical cavity so of the right hip, uh, you can see here. And uh, again, position on the table uh, as much stable as possible. Uh, and then again, we use in this case uh, a number uh, four stem. And again, we check uh, in surgery postoperatively. And, uh, this is a follow-up of five months of the cat that is working properly. So those animals are very good for, um, for keeping them quiet, but they need to be kept in a big cage. They cannot be left free in the apartment like dogs because they're more difficult to keep them under control. So my main comments after my preliminary experience with the Mini is a more challenging than regular in a performance. And so in, per, in doing that procedure, a uh, surgeon need to have a good experience with a regular THR before starting with the mini, but it's feasible. And there uh, is an awesome possibility to perform a cementless THR in so small dogs and cats too, because up to now, only cemented uh, prosthesis were done in uh, small dogs and cats. What we saw is a very quick recovery and a very um, sat excellent satisfaction of the owner. This is, for instance, a Maltese with a luxation on the, this plastic hip, so it was a four degree not weight bearing lameness. And you can see here, uh, two months later, how it's running like a crazy without feeling any pain. So that is a really fantastic outcome that can be achieved in so small dogs too. So this is a really a totally new uh, Zurich uh, total hip replacement. Uh, and it's a complete system for any dogs uh, from one to 100 kilograms because we can treat uh, giant breed dogs too. And in a regular or normal case, the incidence of complication can be reduced to less than 3%. That's what we achieved in the last three years. And uh, also in complex and challenging cases, in the incidence of complication is higher, of course, but can be kept under 10% and possibly reduced to 4 or 5% as it happens in 2018 in our cases. 
Nevertheless, the complex and challenging cases deserve total liver replacement, even there is a higher risk of complication. Looking at the cases in the last 66 years, from 2014 to 2019, you see that a very important drop of the complication and the explant too uh, in the last years compared to the previous years. About challenging cases, I want to, be, to distinguish very clearly from normal cases of heat dysplasia in dogs uh, from seven to months to seven years, and challenging cases in, in more complex condition like uh, luxide dips in young dogs, uh, giant breeds, uh, chronic luxation, unsatisfactory FHO, TPO, DPO, arthroplasty, all dogs over eight years uh, with severe osteoarthritis and osteopenia, obese dogs, uh, and non union or malunion of femoral head or acetabular uh, fractures. So here's an example of what we consider a normal hip dysplasia case where we don't expect to have a higher incidence of um, complication. And this is an example of challenging because of luxoid dips. Uh, so they have a high risk of luxation after surgery or very um, severe dorsal dislocation of the femur. So we have much more tendency to dislocate or revision of FHO, we have a modification, we have a medialization of the trochanter, a lot of uh, uh, sclerosis of the proximal femur, as also in chronic capital freezer fracture, that you can see in, in this case, those are really challenging to be performed. But also in all dogs, we have osteopenia, and you need to protect the femur for fractures. So looking at the complication in 2018 and 2019, with the sixth generation of uh, Zurich hip replacement, accounting for 577 67 cases, 67 cases. Uh, we had the uh, 15 complications with an overall incidence of 2.6, no explant. Uh, but if you divide uh, the normal cases and the challenging cases, and so the challenging cases is about one third of the, of the total, and the normal case is two thirds. And looking at the normal cases, we have only five complications, which means 1.4%, two fracture, two luxation, and one cap avulsion. While in challenging cases, we have a 4.8 incidence of a complication, which is expected because those cases are more risky, and particularly luxation and cap dislodgement. The overall experience is fantastic because uh, the dog regain the ability to gallop, which is uh, completely lost when they are displasting. They do bunny hopping, but they don't do gallop, like you can see in this dog uh, that is uh, um, six and eight months after bilateral hip replacement. So you regain the ability to gallop, which means a full function of the joint. Another important point for the Zurich uh, total liver replacement is the versatility in challenging condition, as, uh, con condition, as we saw in the cases. I will just show you a few cases, like this uh, obese dog, Diana, 48 kilogram Labrador, with a um, dislocation, luxation of the hip on, on a dysplastic hip. So those cases are very risky, and we can manage them just protecting the femur in advance. So when we do our procedure, we bend an arch plate to follow the curvature of the femur to stay behind the, uh, the stem so we can fix the proximal screws and purchase in a good bone stock. And you see here how is the, the plate is bent, and that is a four years follow up of this dog without any complication. And so the dog is still obese and now has a problem in the front leg, legs, but the hips are sound. Also, other dogs with osteopenia and fragile bone, we always protect them systematically over eight years of age with a chronic osteoarthritis. We do that procedure and that make us much more comfortable to, to have no complication, no risk of fracture. Also, big dogs at San Bernard, 78 kilograms, we cannot use a regular uh, implants, so we need uh, the tiger implants, we are designer for the tiger. And so we have a head uh, which is 26 millimeter of diameter, so I have a very big uh, jumping distance. Uh, and uh, we did that in uh, seven cases, so we didn't see any luxation. This is Yogi, a Caucasian Shepherd, 68 kilogram, 
with a luxated uh, dysplastic hip, uh, that is the dog, a big dog, uh, before surgery. So you see it quite lame on the left side. And then uh, we went uh, with the tiger implants. And this is a two years uh, uh, follow up of the left uh, and just uh, three months uh, because we went uh, to do the same procedure on the right side. And now the dog is okay. Failed FHO, failed DPO, other, other condition like in this golden retriever who had that procedure done as well, and it was not properly done, and they also the DPO did not work, and the other side was a, a, an FHO, and the dog was a very very handicapped in the gait and very painful, and so we went with a total hip replacement on the side of the FHO first. And then we went uh, on the side of the DPO, and um, fortunately, this dog has been able to follow. This is a three-year follow-up with a good muscle mass and a complete uh, regain of function. And you can see that the dog is a completely another dog nowadays. Chronic capital fissure fracture can be quite challenging because we have an altered anatomy with medialization of greater trochanter, proximal femoral sclerosis, and difficult canalization. And also, the acetabulum can, um, can lose a cortical bone, and so the press fit could be critical. So, it is an um, overvart, uh, five months uh, of age uh, with a chronic uh, uh, capital fissure fracture that occurred two months earlier and uh, the dog was uh, quite painful. And you see the shift of the body weight on the front limb and a very poor muscle mass. And so we went to do it, that is um, to do the procedure. And in those cases too, we need to protect the trochanter because uh, it's quite risky to have a fracture of the trochanter during the procedure. And this is a one year follow up and the dog returned to normal gait. But the most challenging condition that we faced with, uh, um, with uh, uh, the Kion, uh, the Zurich total hip replacement are the perisprotetic joint infection. That is the most devastating complication of total joint replacement, usually leading to explantation. It's uh, still a challenging the orthopedic community, human and veterinarian. And despite many efforts to reduce the Periprosthetic joint infection, it remained at 1% to 2% incidence in new in people. So the first stage is explant, debridement, cytology, culture, histology, and then we can go for the second stage after 6 to 12 months with the bone remodeling and in case of poor function, we can reimplant. We did that in seven cases uh, with a two-stage revision and this is one example. So we follow the, um, the development and the healing of the bone. You see that the periosteal reaction the, um, uh, that is uh, decreasing. And after 12 months, you see a good smooth surface of the bone. We do a culture, a needle aspiration into the joint. And then if it is negative, we can go and proceed with a rain plant. This golden retriever vanilla was um, has planted in both hips, he got uh, an hematogenous infection due to a severe gastroenteritis uh, that uh, went uh, to affect both hips uh, simultaneously. And so this is um, quite a long-term follow-up of both hips are implanted and, and the dog is still alive and uh, is doing great. Then I want to mention my un unforgettable awesome experience with the tiger in Leipzig in 2011. And that was a very milestone in our experience because uh, that was the first tiger in the world with a semenless total hip replacement. Another tiger in Georgia was implanted with a cement hip but did not survive. And um, those, um, what was interesting is that the implants uh, that we use uh, for that uh, uh, tiger has been used again in a giant breed dogs uh, like Bernese, Great Dane, and so on. So that is called, we call the tiger implants for that reason. And uh, this is um, a girl name of the, the tiger uh, when it was uh, left uh, free to go outside from the big cage. And it was uh, experience again, the freedom to be outside the cage. 
the new challenge is in sport activity dogs. So we want to have those dogs to return to full sport activity uh, when they were affected by hip problems. And we aim to regain high physical performance. This is an, initi an initiative uh, sponsored by Kion, offering to um, three dogs uh, that possibility for free. So they have been treated for free. Uh, implanted hip replacement in those dogs and the reason was because they had a loss of performance and they were already in a sport activity by uh, the loss of performance because of hip problems and so we want um, to check the wear of the cups if any after years uh, leaving those dogs to do again a complete physical activity this was the first dog we did in uh, michigan a uh, border collie and uh, the right side was uh, affected by osteoarthritis, the left side was sound. This is a two months of follow up. And um, you can see that the dog is uh, returning to, um, to training. And now he's uh, still in training, he's a very generous and very um, dedicated dogs for that uh, activity. So uh, we really want, uh, we wish that he will uh, regain a, a full function. This dog has, uh, uh, it was um, taken away from agility and was put under, to do agility underwater, which is another type of activity that those dogs do, uh, because it was getting too tired doing a regular agility. So we went uh, and did uh, bilateral hip replacement in this dog, and uh, now is still already in, uh, in uh, um, training again. Um, and we can see here that is uh, starting with uh, small um, jumps, but just a few months after the second tip is uh, regaining a good uh, attitude for this sport. So Although, in conclusion of my personal experience, oh, yes. Thank you. Go ahead. We are running out of time, just to let you know. Oh yes, I finished. That is the conclusion. So a uh, very positive experience, a really new hip replacement system. Most critical point was addressed to find the solution. Long-term survival of the implant is uh, really expected nowadays. And also a significant reduction of complication from the 12% in the past to the 2.5% nowadays. So more confidence to address severe hip condition in young dogs for lifelong benefit of and full function after hip replacement and uh, semen less is available for any dog from so one kilogram to 100 kilogram. These are, you see, implants for uh, two ki one, two kilogram dog and uh, 100 kilogram dog. You see the huge difference in the size of the implants and the stem. What I learned after 3000, motivation is the engine that moved me forward. Constancy and perseverance allow me to improve the surgical performance. And uh, I will focus on repetition and repetition to do it better and to get consistent outcome. And that it was aiming to reduce complications, studying all the risk factors. Anytime we saw a complication, we wanted to understand why that occurred. And also it's very important to develop a good empathy with the dog owners to meet their expectation and also to solve problems when occurring. Consistent repetition is like to play musical instruments, aiming to perfect performance because as soon more time you repeat and more time you get better. Or like a stem, you want to have uh, like an assembly line to do all this in the best way in a very consistent method. I did the presentation in 2011 in Chicago and that was the title My Last 1000 Cases. So I told, uh, it's not an end result, a starting point to apply the gaming experience to improve the technical and future development and to share the experience done with the, the scientific community and to let other surgeons take advantage of our pioneering experience. So nowadays, uh, I would say exactly the same. And uh, so my, my goal is really to, to discuss with other colleagues, uh, to teach other colleagues uh, to take advantage of my experience. And a sincere acknowledgement to Slobodan, uh, to Steve, uh, to Kyle's staff, particularly to Guy, to my family and to all my staff. And thank you for the attention. I will be pleased to reply to your questions. Thank you.
<laughs> thank you Aldo very much for this impressive Great, presentation thanks. well this achievement you have done in the last couple of years so let's jump directly we will add another 15 minutes just that everybody's aware um, another 15 minutes for questions and answers so please stay in the line if you are interested for the questions and I hand over to you Otto to manage and handle this discussion thank you Otto okay thanks um I have a few questions, but just before I get started, I'd like to congratulate Aldo again for 3,000 cases. That's monumental. And to thank you for all your help, at least with me and helping me getting a better understanding of the total hip. That's much appreciated. Um, the first question uh, goes to Steve. A quick question regarding if you have the fifth generation total hips, can you interchange them with the new ceramic heads? Um, what's your feeling on that, in particular, going back to the fifth generation and fourth generation with high molecular weight polyethylene cups and ceramic heads? Well, you certainly can mix them. I mean, you're going to you're gonna be probably better off because you've got ceramic now running against the polyethylene, but uh, there still is the risk of polyethylene wear. Um, but, you know, it, if you don't have the latest version of the cups, and you're comfortable still putting in the old polyethylene ones and they have not expired, that's going to be a, a, a key point is what the expiration date was on the on the sterilization of the liners. Um, you know, that piece of plastic has been sitting in a bag now for five years, so it's essentially a five-year-old product. Um, it would just be better really to change up to get a new cup. But the, the ceramic can certainly run on it and the geometries are are correct so you wouldn't have any you know um, risk or disadvantage of a wrong size head running inside the cup or something like that so it'd be okay okay um, next couple of questions are for Aldo um, one of the most popular questions is when do you decide to use the dual mobility cups is it just for luxoid hips only or for revisions or when do you recommend using them so now we have quite a confidence with the dual mobility cup, which um, which is available only for 29 and 32 cup, 32 millimeter cup. So you cannot, it's not available for the 26, but uh, for the 26 we have the 19 millimeter head. So that is quite more resistant compared to the 16 millimeter head as was in, in the previous version. So I use that mainly in uh, luxoid hips and in big dogs uh, with a long leg, uh, because even they are not uh, luxoid, they have a higher incidence of luxation. So I still use the 29 of the 32 regular cup with a 19 millimeter head in older dogs uh, with a more with a less range of motion. And but most of the time I prefer to go with the dual mobility cup, uh, which make me more comfortable. Okay, and the next question is concerning the use of the C-arm or intraoperative fluoroscopy. How necessary do you think that is to use? And if you do not have the use of a C-arm, is there any other recommendations you can give to evaluate the position of the acetabular cup intraoperatively? No, for, unfortunately, there is no other way. And the reason why I'm still using every time I do a THR, I still use the CR, even I have uh, the experience of 3,000 cases because you can you can never predict exactly if the if the pelvis moved when you do the procedure, when you do the reaming of the femur, the reaming of the cetabulum. So if you want to be sure, and you want to be sure that when you take your X-ray postoperatively. You don't have a surprise that the cup is to open or to close and you need to go back in surgery and going back in surgery is always a risk of infection so i to me is really mandatory when i teach in my courses i always tell that is fundamental i start using the c arm 20 years ago i bought already several c arm mostly used from human medicine now I have a new one because I'm making many cases I could invest better. But really, you can find quite cheap uh, fluoroscopy unit, and they are very, very, very important. I could not do without nowadays. Okay. Um, and the next question is 
it seems the incidence of performing bilateral total hip arthroplasties is increasing. Do you feel that there are more cases that need bilateral total hip replacements overall? Oh, yes, I, I always recommend bilateral hip replacement. I don't like to have a dog that has a one bad hip and one total hip replacement because it will overload the hip prosthesis because the dog feel pain on the other hip and uh, probably the owner will not really uh, rec recognize uh, that uh, lameness because the dog uh, with the four, uh, four limbs is able to, to mask the pain in that hip. But if you look at the muscle mass, you see that the muscle mass in the in the hip replacement is a double that the other uh, other limb. That means that the prosthesis will be overloaded. And uh, I think that uh, to have uh, to reduce the wear, to have a uh, um, long longevity of the hip implants, you need to share the loading among the two hips. So that is a problem of. Uh, benefit of the dog and well-being so you remove one source of pain of osteoarthritis and then you preserve the hip that you already implanted so we when we tell the owner uh, the dog has a problem on the other hip you should do the second hip in a maximum one year otherwise they lose the guarantee you know that i offer a full life guarantee for any problems to the implants but if they don't do the second dip, they lose the guarantee. Okay, and the next question um, that we have is, and this has been asked a couple of times, what's your feeling on performing DPO and TPO? Are you still performing a lot of those given that you can perform total hips now in younger and younger patients? What's your preference? Uh, my preference is uh, I don't do TPO since uh, 20 years, sorry, no, 15 years, sorry, uh, since 2006 uh, when uh, it's been presented in uh, ESVAP Congress in Munich. So I do DPO because I feel uh, that is much better, is a better an, uh, preservation of the anatomy of the pelvis compared to TPO. Nevertheless, we do DPO, we did one today also, and it's my preference when the indication is really there. And it's very likely that the indication is lost very quickly. So my preference for dogs are about five, maximum six months of age. After that age, most probably the indication is lost because you already have some synovitis. For instance, if the dog is lame, so as a, a very clear clinical signs, it means that there is a, a, a synovitis. And synovitis means that we have already erosion of the cartilage, and that is a contraindication for DPO. So DPO is a preventive surgery. It should be done when you see a, an excessive joint laxity in a puppy without um, already signs of synovitis. So my preference for that, because I can preserve the hip joint and I have already 600 cases of DPO done. And it's a beautiful to see those dogs for all their life with their own joints instead of artificial joints. But if you do DPO when the dog is already advancing in the generation of the joint, then they will deserve total hip replacement later on, which is not good to have two surgeries for that patient. Whoops, okay, one other question, and this one is another question that was asked a few times. What is the best way to estimate the size neck that you will be using after implanting the the acetabular component most people do know about using the round ball and the drill guide as a spacer but do you have any other um, uh, information or advice that will help estimate the length of the neck uh, i think that is a proportion on the size of the dog so if you do a bernese mountain dog for instance or newfoundland of course, you aim to have a medium neck and not a short one. If you do a Labrador or a Border Collie or a Golden Retriever, most of the time they, they are fitting well with a short neck. And if you do even giant breed, of course, you can, can go to long neck, which is more proportional. So to set that, uh, uh, we always check the clearance between the bar inside the, the cup and um, the cut on the neck on the femur 
and then we want to have 1.5 centimeter of that distance pulling the leg distally to be sure that at least the short neck will fit. Because the, the, the mess, the problem is that if you don't have that 1.5 centimeters, so you will not be able to, to even put a short neck. And then if you, if you use a, a neck short neck, most probably you will, will be punished in a few years because the range of motion is more limited and the X short neck can impinge with the cap creating debris. So the X short should be very, very much limited in use. And um, most cases of dogs uh, about uh, from 20 to 35 kilograms, they, you, they are good for a short neck and going over, you will go from the medium. I very rarely use the long neck, very rarely, only for revision when uh, we have a luxation. But my preference is to use a short or a medium, depending by the size of the dog. Okay. And the next quick question is, how young is too young for a total hip? Um, the, the youngest dog we did was a 4.5 months. And we were obliged to do because he had the luxation since already one month. Uh, but of course, that is not the best age. Uh, we had a lot of dogs uh, that we did at six months of age, uh, particularly when they have a full uh, luxation, because if you wait, uh, the, this, the luxation will create a, a dorsal dislocation of the femur that will be very tricky to reduce uh, with increased risk of uh, further dislocation of the prosthesis. And so we prefer to go uh, directly with a hip replacement even at six months of age. Uh, if I can choose, uh, because the, the condition is not so severe, I think that the best age is between eight and nine months of age in, in younger dogs. And the next question, I guess we'll go to Steve, concerning HA coding on the implants. How much, what is the difference between the trial uh, femoral stem and the actual femoral stem that's coated with HA, or is there a difference? I think you're muted, Steve. It's two tenths of a millimeter larger, the actual implant versus the trial implants. And okay. it's also a rougher surface. So if you're right, if you're having trouble getting that trial implant in there, it's going to be a good indication you're going to have a lot of trouble getting the real implant in there, not only the two tenths of a millimeter, but the rough surface. Okay. And this, uh, probably the last question will go to Aldo concerning sclerotic bone. When you have a lot of sclerosis of the acetabulum, um, do you see any difference in bone integration of the acetabular component? And is there anything that you do specifically in these cases to help with bone integration? Um, when you have a sclerosis, uh, the sclerosis is an issue in the femur. So to, for uh, preparation of the femoral canal and uh, in, when you have the sclerosis that you can anticipate looking at the X-ray, uh, you have to use uh, the high speed burr to help you to go inside and not to perforate the caudal cortex uh, or the lateral cortex. So it's very important to have a, a high speed burr available. Concerning the cap, uh, Nowadays, I don't use anymore the revision cap. And the reason is because uh, the peak cap are stronger, more stiff, and so you can achieve a very good press fit even if you have a cancellation of the acetabulum because it was not loaded, because it was after FHO, for instance. So you can get a very good press fit with the new peak cap. And uh, since I think things already three or four years, I, I didn't use anymore any revision cap. And just to follow up on that question, because I did respond to the person that asked it, um, are you still recommending the osteostixis and the bone graft from the proximal femur in the acetabulum once you finish your reaming? Yes, uh, we all, every time we see cortical bone, we do osteostixis, and uh, in the fossa, if there's some remaining fossa there, we put some cancellous bone that we collect when we rim the femur. Okay, and, and I see Guy appearing, so I think that's all the time we have, and I'll, I'll let Guy wrap things up. 
Thank you very much, Otto. And yeah, first of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you, Dr. Aldo Vezzoni, for uh, your presentation, but also for the achievement of the 3,000 cases. So well done, Aldo. Steve, as well, thank you for joining for your presentation, and Otto, as well, for moderating the questions. And I would like also take the opportunity to thank all attendees for taking part of this webinar, but also our team to make that happen, um, that we're able to do these kind of things and this kind of learning experience. And we hope we met your expectations. Just like a few final words here, what you can see on the slide, um, as soon as the webinar closes, there will be a very short survey, just like five questions, and we would appreciate to get your feedback. We will, second point, we will continue to provide education courses for THR as listed on the screen and some much more um, uh, courses about PGR, Paul 2 and so on. So further information, please visit our website on kion.ch. And if you are also interested to get further information on education, webinars, events, new products, please subscribe to our newsletter. It's also available on the website. And finally, you will receive a follow-up email after that um, webinar with the recorded session so you can review and go into the presentations again and if you have any further questions we are here to help you and please contact us so i wish you a great afternoon or evening wherever you are thank you again for joining and have a good one bye bye yeah.